Chapter 10 Buried I leant upon a coppice gate when frost was spectre grey, and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled bind stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. Thomas Hardy, The Darkling Thrush, 1900 There was no warning, no way to save themselves, really. The weather doomed them that day. The air was heavy and wet, and their homes offered no protection. It was a national disaster, mass panic. But it wasn't another deadly fog. This time it was the Atlantic Ocean that was causing such suffering and hardship. The damage was more sudden, more dramatic, but as devastating as it was, it still wasn't as deadly as the fog, even if the government wouldn't admit it yet. Still, the way they died was terrible. On January 31st, 1953, as the North Sea churned with spring tides, a deep depression in the Atlantic spawned massive gale winds. The weather system pushed north over Scotland and raced southeast down the coast of England. Winds whirled over England up to 126 miles per hour. While these gale-force winds were pummeling the coast, the North Sea was also at high tide, a calamitous and deeply unfortunate confluence of events. The gusts, combined with the Atlantic Ocean's waves and the low pressure, caused an unprecedented storm surge, with water levels almost 19 feet above sea level. Tidal waves slammed into eastern coastal towns in England, as well as parts of Scotland, Belgium, and the Netherlands. The flood damage was devastating. The water poured through doors and top-floor windows of homes and businesses in Lincolnshire, Norfolk, Suffolk, and Essex. It spilled into the windows of cars, trapping people inside. The waves and wind smashed through weak sea walls, causing a wall of water to rush inland and killing 307 people in England. An additional 19 died in Scotland, 28 in Belgium, and an astonishing 1,800 in the Netherlands. Half the country was just a few feet above sea level, leaving it vulnerable to massive floods. Queen Elizabeth II rushed to the English coast, offering condolences on behalf of the royal family. But the deaths were only the beginning of the frustration. The area was devastated, and the British government evacuated more than 30,000 people. The flood deluged power stations, railways, and gasworks, severely damaging the essential infrastructure of the entire region. It was Britain's worst natural disaster in the 20th century, and it came with a tremendous cost for the already struggling nation, about £50 million, a crippling debt for a bankrupt government. The storm damage was calamitous, the result of bad fortune and poor planning. MPs spewed vitriol in the House of Commons, distress and concern masked as contempt. The government, including the previous Labour cabinet, had neglected to set up a proper storm warning system. The wooden, prefabricated post-war buildings, built under the supervision of the Ministry of Housing just a few years before, had crumbled in the waves. Film footage running nightly on television showed scenes of frightened mothers and children crammed into emergency shelters. Day after day, editors stuffed newspapers with stories topped with headlines like Flood Havoc in Holland, Death Toll Mounting, and Cost of Flood Disaster. It was crucial that the public see the government reacting quickly and decisively during such a public calamity. It was a stark contrast to Parliament's reaction to the fog almost two months before. Winston Churchill's cabinet quickly prioritized which rebuilding projects would be fully funded. On March 14th, Minister of Housing Harold Macmillan sent the group a confidential memo insisting that future flood prevention was the first concern. Every necessary expenditure by local authorities on the restoration of coast protection works to their pre-flood condition should be reimbursed in full, wrote Macmillan. I am sure that the House will not tolerate anything less. The will was there, but the coffers were empty, and getting the money to these projects and people was going to be a challenge. The first week of February was filled with debates in Parliament, many of them antagonistic. 
and the bickering exacerbated the already testy relationship between Harold Macmillan and Labour MP Norman Dodds. Their resentment intensified with Macmillan's controversial decision to cancel the requisition of twenty empty houses for flood victims in Erith in southeast London. Macmillan was absent from the session that day because he was touring the flood damage on the coast, moving slowly from town to town, mostly being carried in a duck, an amphibious American military vehicle. It was very hard to make out just what was the extent of the great flood, Macmillan wrote in his diary, but it was clear that it was a terrible calamity. Macmillan's key spokesman, Ernest Marples, took his place in Parliament. Norman rose to ask the Parliamentary Secretary a question which quickly evolved into an interrogation. Does the right honourable gentleman appreciate that there are hundreds of people, men, women and children, in church halls, and that this type of accommodation is not suitable for more than twenty-four or forty-eight hours, demanded Norman. His fellow Labour MP screamed shame toward Marples before he had even had a chance to respond. We ask that without further delay these twenty houses, which are now empty, will be used, said Norman. It was a small point in the overall scheme of the disaster, but it was symbolic, and Norman enjoyed winning a few symbolic victories. They showed tenacity, especially when they were wins against unpopular ministers. Norman knew that to get things done in a bureaucracy, a politician needed to move public opinion first, and then lawmakers would likely follow. Marples, bracing for a long, arduous session, calmly explained that the housing minister's decision was a practical one. He hadn't cancelled the requisitioning of the homes, insisted Marples, because he had never given his permission to begin with. The short-term problem is to get these unfortunate people into furnished accommodation, explained Marples, because when a person is wet through and has lost his possessions, he does not want an unfurnished house. It was a good point, and as usual, Marples made it eloquently. Norman wasn't an expert debater, but he was determined, and he had supporters behind him. Answer the question, yelled scores of Labour MPs. Marples faced the jeers and stayed composed, at least in the House of Commons. That evening, Marples made an urgent call to Harold Macmillan, who was in Hunstanton, a seaside town in Norfolk, England, still touring flood damage. I got a telephone call. The telephone had just been repaired about a row in the House of Commons in my absence, Harold Macmillan wrote in his diary. Poor Marples had, it seems, a rough time, which was caused by Mr. Dodds. Macmillan was convinced that Labour was turning a natural disaster into a political scrap, and he blamed Norman, who was quickly becoming more than just an occasional bother. The socialists are still trying to make capital out of the disaster, of course, Macmillan mused. Norman's designation as a provocateur for Labour was one of his most important roles in Parliament. It clearly vexed the Conservatives, particularly Macmillan. Much of the arguing over the flood, the fog, and just about any subject was created for political strategy. And despite the hostility in Parliament, the government did act swiftly in the flood's aftermath. There were studies on strengthening coastal defences and proposals to build storm surge barriers on the River Thames and the River Hull. The government quickly offered funds to help rebuild and relocate families. Norman agreed with the decisions, that was also one of his duties, to help promote unity in Parliament during a national catastrophe. But when the debates shifted to air pollution, he was happily a pest. The Cabinet's speedy reaction to the East Coast floods nagged at Norman. The government was adept at crisis management, yet there had been no rapid response after the fog last December. Both disasters had resulted in tremendous loss of life, but the death tolls were so different. The flood had killed fewer than 400 in Britain, while the fog had murdered thousands. Who cared for those victims? The government had been passive over air pollution, and now Norman was ready to awaken conservative lawmakers. With the emergence of this new disaster, the fog quickly vanished from the order papers in Parliament and faded from the newspaper headlines. Certainly the media was partly to blame, footage of despondent, homeless survivors wading through their homes and collecting ruined belongings was broadcast across the city.
The visuals were indelible. Norman knew why the fog didn't receive the same attention. Film of Londoners hacking and feeling their way through clouds of smoke evoked little empathy. All Britons endured fogs they had for centuries. The East Coast floods, an unparalleled natural disaster, were threatening to usurp December's fog as the country's leading tragedy. Norman refused to let that happen. They lay in the dark, just the two of them, for weeks. It was dusty and cold in that old coal cupboard. Soon after they died, the smell had become putrid. Then, on March 6th, there was a bit of light. Someone ripped down part of the wall and opened the door to their hiding place, perhaps a suspicious investigator. Maybe the police would finally catch him and unveil his depravity. But it was only the man again. He stood in the darkness of the entryway, dragging along another companion to keep them company. He didn't even bother shrouding this one. She was still wearing her blue bra and black stockings, her hands tied with a white handkerchief. He heaved her toward the opening. He wasn't strong enough to carry her. He tossed her on the ground. She slumped, her back facing him like a tattered rag doll discarded by an ungrateful child. Her head drooped. A deep, dark indentation circled her neck. He began sealing all three of them back up again behind the wall. The woman was 27-year-old Hectorina McLennan, a Scottish girl born in Glasgow. Like Kathleen and Rita, she had illegitimate children. Two of them were living with her parents in Scotland. Ina, as she was called, had had a complicated life even before she met the stranger. She bounced between two men, one married and the other in prison. It was a familiar story, a vulnerable woman, unstable and overwhelmed with life in London, struggling just to stay safe. In early 1953, Ina met him in front of a cinema in Hammersmith, a tall, slender man who offered to sublet his flat in Notting Hill. Ina visited the nasty place, towing along her boyfriend. The stranger seemed irked. I told you not to tell anyone, he snapped at her. I don't want a lot of people making inquiries about the flat. He reluctantly served them tea and then offered to let them stay for a few nights. Ina and the stranger slept near each other in his kitchen in two chairs while her boyfriend lay on a mattress in the back bedroom. It would be inappropriate for you two to sleep in the same bed, he told them. My wife Ethel might walk in and become upset. Little did they know they were sleeping just feet away from Ethel, still tucked under the floorboards. The man gained Ina's trust slowly. The couple even left some personal items there, intending to return later. Then Ina blundered, a small misstep, just like his other victims. That Friday she arrived at his flat alone. His method and tools were nearly infallible by now. The deck chair, the coal gas pumped through a rubber tube, the ligature, and the disposal. She had scratches on her back from being dragged, before evening arrived that Friday, Hectorina McLennan became yet another package stuffed inside the coal cupboard. He didn't have time to wrap her in blankets or a pillowcase. Unfortunately, Ina arrived with some inconveniences. Unlike the others, she was missed. That same day, just hours after he killed her, there was a quick knock at his door. It was her boyfriend demanding to know if Ina had kept her appointment at the flat. He had waited for her at a cafe for nearly three hours, he complained. Come in and look around, the man replied. The boyfriend moved from room to room, through the parlor and into the kitchen. He stood so close to her, just feet away. He was confused, then perturbed. The stranger offered to help him search in Shepherd's Bush, just a few blocks away. The door closed, the lock turned. And now the three women were abandoned once again. The British government's swift reaction to the January floods that destroyed homes and lives in parts of northern Europe was justified, of course. The cause of the tragedy was evident and the remedy was clear. But there was no such consensus in the months after the December 1952 fog. Agreement on just what had caused the fog and how to prevent it in the future was in danger of getting locked up in politics, bureaucracy and government inaction. The government hoped the public's ambivalence about air pollution would continue. 
Norman Dodds watched as each week passed and a new disaster took the fog's rightful spot on the front pages of the country's newspapers. There was always another crisis, another big story. The threat of the fog would virtually recede in collective memory. The moment to act for change would be lost, at least until the next cold snap. But Norman was determined to force Parliament to focus on air pollution. By early spring, inside the government buildings on Whitehall, the Tory ministers were sorting through a blizzard of reports about the fog, hoping to answer two substantial questions. The first was whether the fog was even responsible for thousands of deaths. Was there definitive proof? And the second, which component of the fog had proved to be so deadly? The opposition, led by Norman, arrived at Parliament daily, armed with accusations. MPs demanded an independent inquiry headed by independent experts who didn't have a stake in the results. But Churchill's ministers took their time to coalesce. They sparred over the government's message. Was coal the real killer? The General Register Office, the department in charge of collecting statistics on victims, offered some advice. A researcher suggested a way for the Ministry of Health to redirect the blame away from home fireplaces packed with the government's cheap coal. It may be very important to establish, if it can be established, whether the deaths can fairly be charged to some more specialised sources than the domestic fires, wrote a GRO officer to a doctor with the Ministry of Health. Other causes? Like what? The officer suggested that perhaps the government might find something else to blame for the fog, a cause that might be less expensive to correct. Again, the Ministry of Health restricted its purview to the impact of the fog on the health of Londoners, not the source of the pollution. But the Labour Party continued to hammer Conservative MPs publicly. By early spring, they were targeting the majority of Churchill's ministers in Parliament during a barrage of aggressive questioning. The Minister of Fuel and Power was pummeled day after day over cheap, dusty, nutty slack. Even members of his own party demanded detailed answers. By February of 1953, the government released more than one million tonnes of the fuel for sale to the public, and Britons bought nearly 20% of the stock within three months. Nutty slack was dirty, it burned poorly, and MPs griped to the Fuel and Power Minister that it was too costly, in more ways than one, for the price his countrymen were paying for the stuff. Is the Minister aware that to charge more than five shillings a hundredweight for this rubbish is barefaced robbery? asked Labour MP Willie Hamilton. Can he indicate the correlation between the derationing of this nutty slack and the increase in fogs in the London area? Geoffrey Lloyd avoided both questions and then promptly promoted the cheap fuel. I am myself a user of nutty slack, contended Lloyd, and in my opinion it is useful, particularly in this cold weather, to eke out supplies of ordinary coal. The National Smoke Abatement Society, the government's intrepid antagonist, set out to discover the true cost of using this cheap fuel. The government had rejected the society's request for funding earlier in the month, so, in response, the members published a scathing survey of the fog in the society's popular quarterly journal, Smokeless Air. In it, there were details about pollution levels, meteorological conditions, medical reports, and financial predictions. The fog would cost London millions of pounds. There would be massive bills thanks to grounded planes, extra police, overworked hospital staff and lost wages for most industries which were shut down for five days. The report was circulated throughout Parliament. Now MPs demanded that the Minister of Fuel and Power respond to the Society's accusations, particularly its sharp attack on nutty slack. Does the Right Honourable Gentleman still maintain that the use of nutty slack which seems to produce smoke without fire, is having no effect whatsoever on the pollution of the air over our great towns and cities, asked a Labour MP pointedly. The government still defended Nutty Slack, albeit less fiercely, claiming it was the best the government could offer right now, a slightly less full-throated voice of support than they had offered just a few weeks before. Of course it is the fact that coal, even good coal, produces smoke, and it is a matter of degree, 
Minister of Fuel and Power Geoffrey Lloyd replied, but it also produces warmth, which is very much required at the present time. He added, this particular coal has needlessly got a bad reputation in regard to that particular fog. Each session, Norman Dodds and his smoke abatement supporters castigated the Conservative government. One Tory demanded to know why three million tons of good quality coal was reserved for large industry rather than domestic fireplaces. A Labour MP questioned whether Housing Minister Harold Macmillan had reviewed America's report on the Donora, Pennsylvania smog, the one requested by Norman Dodds. The results of the Donora report have been studied and are being borne in mind, replied Macmillan's parliamentary secretary in a clipped and, some felt, dismissive voice. The Minister of Housing was working quickly to complete the Prime Minister's deadline of building 300,000 houses per year. Macmillan realised that his future in politics could depend on the project's success. The Prime Minister vowed that Britons would soon have new homes. Churchill says it is a gamble, make or mar my political career, wrote Macmillan in his diary in October 1951, but every humble home will bless my name if I succeed. The Minister of Housing was focused on his main task, a very important one, building new houses for a country still climbing out of rubble. In the spring, Churchill's entire cabinet was asked essentially the same question most days. What is the government doing about air pollution? The answer was consistently ambiguous. We're conducting research and gathering committees, but both take time to reach conclusions. Internally, the ministries now settled on a message. Investigations are continuing. The Minister of Fuel and Power, the MP charged with monitoring the main sources of pollution, was especially vulnerable to public accusations. So to allay his anxiety, he called a meeting with the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Housing. The Minister was greatly concerned at the suggestions that the marketing of nutty slack was associated with a fog producing an abnormally high death rate read the minutes of the February 24th meeting. In fact, the distribution of this fuel had not begun at the time of the fog. That was patently false. The government had begun marketing nutty slack about two weeks before the start of the fog, and the coal dust went on sale December 1st, four days before the anticyclone arrived in London. The ministers then discussed diesel exhaust from vehicles like the new double-decker buses and whether it might have also contributed to the deadly fog. No, said a doctor with the Ministry of Health, although the exhaust sometimes contained a high content of finely divided carbon, there was as yet no evidence to suggest that the latter had carcinogenic properties. That was also false. A few weeks later, on March 28th, the Ministry of Housing sent a confidential note to Minister of Health Ian MacLeod. There is now an urgent need for a comprehensive review of the problem, covering effects, causes and cure, and that this might best be undertaken by an interdepartmental committee, read the memo. The setting up of such a committee would help to allay public disquiet about the dangers of the fog, and the publication of its report would make it clear to the general public just what could and could not be done to eliminate pollution. The Minister of Health quickly refused to be on the new committee. In fact, he requested that Harold Macmillan omit his name from the announcement. Once again, Ian MacLeod was drawing a line. The Health Minister would not be pulled into a public row involving the cause of the smog. And he refused to be rushed, even in the House of Commons. Near the end of March, Parliament slogged through a debate that dragged on for more than five hours. MPs revived arguments over how East Coast flood victims would be compensated, and the strain between Norman Dodds and the housing minister intensified. Norman and Macmillan each pontificated in 30-minute segments, trading barbs in polite terms constrained by the formal rules of Parliament. But as the contest escalated, each man seemed to agitate the other more. The content of the debate wasn't as important as how they debated. Unless much more is done to correct those things which have not been done properly, there will be many more of these debates, snapped Norman. Macmillan countered with jibes about the Labour MP's character and tone of his attacks upon us ever since this matter started. The dispute finally concluded amid clapping and taunts 
with the House of Commons ultimately supporting the Prime Minister's plan to distribute funds. But Harold Macmillan had the final word, and he lambasted Norman Dodds. I feel myself that since this debate started, there have been opposite me a number of Balaams, declared Macmillan, referring to the wicked prophet in the Bible. They came to curse, but they stayed to bless. On that biblical note, I stated earlier that I might even get a blessing from the Honourable Member for Dartford before I had finished. Norman stood up. I always give credit where credit is due. But he was far from sincere. Norman and Macmillan's relationship was periodically argumentative and sporadically cordial, but thanks to the fog it had devolved into combative, and it would soon become bitter. Despite the bickering and boasting in Parliament, there was now urgency for both sides, cold weather was less than six months away, and so was, to be certain, another sickening fog. But the media's attention seemed to have shifted to other stories, the flood, the budget, and soon enough, a serial killer murdering women in London. There were just a few, at first, a handful of lurkers who were curious about the framed note tacked to a screen of corrugated iron. It was March 24th, right before lunchtime. They glanced at the pair of royal guards, then squinted at the small type, printed on official royal stationery. Then they strolled away. A second framed note arrived two hours later, and more Londoners took notice this time. There were hundreds now, concerned faces, reading the bulletin outside of Marlborough House, the mansion in Westminster that was home to Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, Queen Mary. During the past hours, Queen Mary's condition has become more grave. There has been a serious weakening of the heart action, which gives rise to increasing anxiety, read the notice. Later that night, Prime Minister Winston Churchill stood up after the final vote for the evening of Parliament. I beg to move that this house do now adjourn, he said with a strained voice. I have with great regret to make the announcement that Queen Mary has died. Queen Mary, the mother of King George VI, had passed away in her sleep at the age of eighty-five. In the House of Commons, MPs bowed their heads. Labour leader Clement Attlee replied, I am sure the whole house will join in that expression of sorrow. Despite the feuds imbued with self-promotion, most politicians cherished the royal family. Hundreds now gathered before Marlborough House to read the final notice and lament the Queen's death. A line of photographers loitered near the gate, waited for details. Women and children wept, men gripped their hats. They all pushed to the front just to get a glimpse of the letter. Queen Mary was a beloved figure for epitomizing poise and grace under the weight of public scrutiny. She discharged the duties of her high station with a dignity which was truly queenly, read her obituary in the Times, and which yet won for her the warm-hearted admiration of the populace. She had outlived her husband and three of her six children. She had survived two wars with regal nobility. She had watched with concern as one son ascended the throne and then abdicated to marry an American divorcee. She oversaw her second son's reign of more than fifteen years, only to witness his death in 1952. And she had been readying for her granddaughter Elizabeth to be crowned queen in a few short months. But she was not to live to see Elizabeth's coronation. British flags were lowered to half-mast, while newspaper vendors peddled papers with headlines reading, Death of Queen Mary. It was such a sombre occasion for a country anticipating the crowning of Queen Elizabeth II scheduled for the summer. Queen Mary had told her family that, in the event of her death, her granddaughter's coronation celebration in June was not to be postponed. It was just three months away. By March of 1953, life was arduous for John Reginald Christie. He was nearly destitute, and his landlord, Charles Brown, was demanding rent. Reg was three months delinquent. His milk and coal bills were overdue, too. He had drained the couple's bank accounts, even forging Ethel's signature. He allowed his life insurance policy to lapse. There was no one alive to collect the proceeds anyway. Reg had no more furniture to sell, no jewellery to pawn. His government assistance had run out. He really needed those two pounds a week. Of course, none of that deterred him from prowling Notting Hill, searching for women. He tried to lure them to his flat, 
those girls he chatted with at local cafes. If he was able to entice them inside, they were quickly frightened off. Reg was soon labelled the creepy man with the strange laugh. His luck was waning. It was time to leave. Reg had his beloved Irish terrier afflicted with old age, euthanized. He met a couple, the Rileys, who were interested in subletting his flat. Reg requested three months' rent in advance, about eight pounds. He even had them sign a lease. During their tour of the flat, Reg pointed to the newly whitewashed area where the coal cupboard stood. Those repairs I did myself, he said. Mrs. Riley sniffed. I noticed a peculiar smell in the place, she later said. We tried to open the cupboard in the kitchen, but found that we could not. So we left it. His agreement with the Rileys was illegal. Reg knew his landlord would never allow them to stay. It didn't matter. He handed Mr. Riley the keys and shoved some papers, clothes and trinkets into a borrowed brown suitcase. He stepped into the hallway, shut the door and turned the key one last time. On March 20th, 1953, John Reginald Christie disappeared from the doorway of 10 Rillington Place. Rosemary Sargent's younger sister Sue was slipping on her brownie uniform, carefully pulling up the brown knee-length socks, gripping the trademark woolen beret. Rosemary helped her straighten the tunic dress adorned with badges and patch pockets. When they finished, Sue looked at her older sister and asked a simple question. Where's Dad? Their father had passed away months earlier, but there were still no discussions about his death, the nasty fog, or the vacant parlour. Rosemary was surprised, then confused. I told you, he died, she replied. Sue's eyes widened. No, I thought he was in hospital. The little girl said a friend down the road had walked over to her earlier in the day and declared, Your dad is dead. Sue didn't believe her, but she was confused. She remembered staying at Mrs. Hattam's house with her best friend for so many days after the fog lifted. Didn't you think it was strange that you stayed there so long? asked Rosemary gently. No, I just thought he was in hospital, replied Sue. She began to cry. After their father died, Sue slept with their mother every night. Edna wanted the little girl to keep her company. The six-year-old loathed not having her own room, and now she was sleeping in the bed where her father had once lain. Rosemary pitied her little sister, but there was nothing she could do. Beresford Brown stared at the wall, trying to sort out the project. It was March 24th, and he wanted to hang a wireless set in the small kitchen so he could listen to music while he cooked. The wall needed to be solid, or the metal brackets would pop right out. He tapped and listened. The top section sounded promising, but as Brown moved his knuckles down the wall, the sound began to thump like a hollow log. There must be a cellar of some sort on the corner of the kitchen, Brown thought. He started peeling off the wallpaper, peering inside a six-inch hole in the door. It was a cellar, but he couldn't quite see inside. He went to his own flat upstairs to search for a flashlight. Beresford Brown stood in the flat that had belonged to John Reginald Christie, the strange man on the ground floor who had complained constantly. None of the residents of Ten Rillington Place had seemed disappointed to watch him pack up his sorry suitcase and leave four days earlier. The landlord, however, was livid that Reg had tried to illegally sublet his flat. Charles Brown evicted the Rileys just days after they moved in. A few days later, Charles's wife chatted with Beresford Brown, another Rillington Place resident who had lived above Reg for a few months and gave him permission to use Reg's kitchen while the apartment was empty. So here Brown stood, peering into the once hidden cellar in the ground floor flat. He flicked on his flashlight. He stuck his hand inside the hole and looked down. The flashlight illuminated the cupboard. The light bounced off Ina's pale skin. She glowed. Everything happened very quickly after that. Within hours, ten Rillington Place was swarming with Metropolitan Police, processing the scene and peering into every dusty corner of the small, dilapidated flat. A police photographer snapped pictures. He was the same officer who had taken photos of Beryl and Geraldine Evans after investigators discovered them in the wash house three years before. Cops stood in front of the building protecting the entrance from gawkers. 
CID, the Met's criminal investigation department, sent a team of detectives to gather evidence. Those three women inside that coal cupboard stayed crammed in there for hours while police jotted down notes. Then, one by one, they were pulled out and laid on the kitchen floor. Reg's alcove provided almost perfect conditions for preservation. It was cool and dry, with a bit of airflow. Investigators waited for the pathologist. Once he had finished prodding them, they were shoved into body bags. Then detectives, with their lit pipes still gripped between their teeth, carried them through the front door and into a horde of news photographers. The cameras were close to the police van, just a few feet away. A wave of neighbors nudged forward, and then two more bodies followed behind. Reporters scribbled notes, called out questions. The press was frenzied. Journalists begged for any tidbits. What happened? Are there more? Later that night, Chief Inspector Albert Griffin carefully stepped through the parlor. It was cramped and dark, so empty. It was hard to imagine that anyone could live in that flat. There were papers, rubbish lying all over, ash and dirt. Griffin scanned the walls looking for fresh wallpaper in the parlor. Nothing there, really, but a portrait of Reg dressed in his policeman's uniform. The fireplace was empty. He glanced down and noticed something odd. Loose floorboards. I lifted the floorboards and noticed that the earth under the floor had been disturbed, said Griffin. I later made a further examination and discovered another body, which was completely buried in the earth, two feet six inches below the floor. There were more photographs, more measurements, and plenty of notes. Police took samples of the dirt and coal ashes. Ethel Christie lay there, wrapped tightly like a mummy. She had been secluded under those floorboards for more than three months, and she would have to wait in that hole for twelve more hours while young police constables stepped around her. Griffin looked out the kitchen window, the one overlooking the back garden, Reg's private plot. Three days later, officers from Notting Hill Station arrived to dig. Their sergeant stood inside in the flat, watching them as they thrust shovels into the ground. That was his job, to ensure that his officers were properly digging through the dirt identifying important pieces of evidence during a sort of grid search. They dropped various bits into boxes, categorized them, squinted at every tiny item. News photographers stood atop nearby buildings, clicking their shutters, capturing scenes of investigators sorting through mounds of evidence. Police easily unearthed the remains of Ruth First and Muriel Eady in the small garden. They were barely covered with dirt, but they were so degraded that they came out in pieces, chunks of bone, an assortment of teeth, clumps of hair mixed with weeds, shards of newspaper, and chipped flower pots. The discovery of the teeth was important. Pathologists eventually identified Ruth by her metal crown, one they determined had been made either in Germany or a country close by. Ruth was in fact Austrian. Their flesh had rotted long ago, but the officers found a skull shattered into almost one hundred pieces. They used sifters to sort out the rubbish. There were bones everywhere, not just human. The garden contained skeletons of codfish, chickens, turkeys, rabbits, rats, cats, dogs, even sheep and cattle. And investigators finally noticed that femur bone propping up the fence, Muriel's leg, which had been hidden in plain sight for years. The officers divided the garden into sections to keep the locations straight. The sergeant left his officers, walked into the home, and strolled through the flat. He stood in the parlor and stared at the hole in the floor. He remembered that day in January when he had shaken the man's hand. What a rotten stink that is, the policeman had complained. Well, it's all these colored people and their strange cooking, the man had replied. It makes a terrible smell. Len Trevelyan now realized he had stood over Ethel Christie that day. He had been just inches above her. The sergeant walked out of the parlor. He moved toward the kitchen and looked over at the hole in the wall where the women had been entombed. He now realized he had been casually chatting with a freak, a depraved serial killer who preyed on the most vulnerable, the weakest, and discarded them with little care and no conscience. Len peered out the window toward the garden, tried to concentrate on the digging, but he spotted something, a shiny box.
It lay atop a pile of rubbish. His officers, exhausted from their digging, didn't seem to notice it amid the mounds of junk. He swung open the back door, walked over, and bent down. He recognized the label. It was a small gold-leaf tobacco tin, copper-colored. Len held it in his palm, then carefully pried open the lid. He stared down. Crammed inside were dozens of tiny pieces of hair. Pubic hair. What came next was terrible anxiety spreading across the city, provoked by salacious newspaper reports. Three women found dead in flat, read the headline of the Times. The story was published before the discovery of Ethel Christie's body was reported to the press. The police were anxious to trace John Reginald Christie, a road haulage clerk who might be able to assist in the inquiry, read the report. Aged 55, height 5 feet 9 inches, slim build, dark hair, thin on top, clean-shaven, sallow complexion, long nose, wearing horn-rimmed spectacles, dentures top and bottom, walks with military bearing. At the bottom of the story was an important paragraph, information that would change so much about British law. In December 1949, Mrs. Beryl Evans, aged 19, and her daughter Geraldine, aged 14 months, were found strangled in an outhouse at the same address. In March 1950, Mrs. Evans' husband, Timothy John Evans, aged 25, a lorry driver, was hanged for the murder of his child. Was there, could there be, a connection? But that story would have to wait. There was a killer stalking London. The daily headlines were so alarming. Nationwide search for tenant of murder flat, said the Daily Telegraph. Murder unlimited, read another. Papers around the world printed lengthy pieces. Police hunting for man with inane laugh, read the Sydney Morning Herald. The media nicknamed Reg the Notting Hill Killer and Jack the Strangler, and some newspapers simply stoked fears with headlines like Search for Moon Mad Killer. It claimed that Scotland Yard detectives were desperate to arrest Reg in the next 48 hours before the full moon would trigger another killing spree. A new examination of the mutilated bodies suggests he is mentally deranged and addicted to uncontrollable passion, claimed one paper. Reg never mutilated the bodies. Pathologists would later conclude that he never even hit the women. The press craved a lewd story, but as the first bodies were being removed, journalists weren't particularly interested in the facts. Now hundreds of Met officers fanned out all over London in one of the largest manhunts in British history. Scotland Yard sent an express message to police departments ordering all districts to search for Reg. I have to inform you that hotels and boarding houses in this town have been visited in an attempt to trace John Reginald Halliday Christie, so far without success, Brighton's chief constable replied. Search has been made of the missing persons files here. And families of missing girls sent messages begging police to investigate their cases. The police collected hundreds of telegrams, letters and phone calls, all from people claiming to have spotted John Reginald Christie. Officers stored bags of notes, and some might have included legitimate leads, but others were simply so absurd they were amusing. There was a lengthy letter from a clairvoyant who claimed to have visions of the victims. The writer referenced quotes from the woman pulled from a newspaper story. The first was that of a young girl sitting at a table, the clairvoyant said in the article. A man was leaning over her. A man from Amsterdam claimed he could track down Reg using a colour system based on the women's names if only the police could send him a list of possible locations where their suspect might be. Police chased down leads, including one concerning note found in a garden in Milton Common about an hour from London by bus. Any person who finds this, communicate with New Scotland Yard. I am a prisoner in 10 Rillington Place, London. Another letter read, You will never get me. I am leaving England. Goodbye, staring eyes. The signature referenced an unflattering description of Reg at cafes, served as a nickname of sorts, like Jack the Ripper. Most of the information made no sense, and as the search dragged on for a week, the public's anxiety peaked. Londoners stared at copies of newspapers with Reg's picture on the cover. 
He was spotted everywhere, on subway platforms, in cafes and hotels all over the city and even across the country. The police had a hard time keeping up. One woman claimed he was a crossing guard in Notting Hill. I cannot remember his face very well, she said, but I remember his hands. I remember his thumb. The families of the victims arrived at Kensington Mortuary and identified each of their bodies, including Ethel's brother, Henry Waddington. Rita Nelson's sister looked at her corpse. They had not communicated for three months. Hectorina McLennan's two brothers identified her body. No family arrived for Kathleen Maloney, so a male acquaintance confirmed her identity for police. It was such a painful process. The angst even spilled into the House of Commons during a debate over reform of the British press. Frustrated, MPs wanted to limit the rights of journalists. How is the public to deal with the sordid, squalid and revolting accounts of the Christie case which have monopolized pages and pages of our evening and daily press in the last few weeks? asked an exasperated Labour MP. Met officers guarded Tenrillington Place as the terrible address took on the dark glamour of infamy. Miscreants were stealing bricks from the building and selling them as souvenirs. The outside of the flat served as a photo opportunity for tourists. Hundreds of people stood on the sidewalk, staring at the murder house. Beresford Brown, the man who had discovered the bodies, received a threatening anonymous letter warning him to leave London. The other tenants abandoned the building. No one wanted to live in the House of Horrors. Five days after the search began for Reg, the New York Times reported the discovery of what seemed to be the bones of a sixth woman victim added horror tonight to London's gruesome crime sensation, the Notting Hill House of Murder. Police had finally found Muriel Eady, Reg's second victim. Ruth First had been discovered first. Once again, December's deadly fog was nowhere in the newspapers. A serial killer on the run now overshadowed a mass murderer that had slaughtered thousands. He was so exhausted, and he was ready to return home, back to Ten Rillington Place. After leaving his flat on March 20th, Reg wandered to King's Cross and just stood there on the street. He stopped a man walking by and asked if he could recommend cheap accommodations. The man suggested Roughton House, once described as a working man's hotel, where a labourer could get a bed with clean sheets, a nice washroom, and access to a large dining hall. When Reg visited, poor pensioners slept there because it offered nicer quarters than other institutional facilities. The National Assistance Board referred many people with a small budget. He walked inside the large corner building and requested a room. When the manager asked for his details, he replied, John Reginald Christie, 10 Rillington Place, then provided his identity card number. He carried papers with him, his marriage certificate, his St. John's ambulance badge, two ration books, and his Queen's Park Rangers football club badge. He didn't lie. He wasn't trying to hide anything. He didn't seem to have the energy for dishonesty. Before leaving Rillington Place, he had gathered some meager items, but things that were special to him. Inside the case were photographs and extra pairs of spectacles, along with a woman's scarf and gloves. The manager looked him over and agreed to give him a bed for a week. Reg stayed quietly at Roughton House for four days and then walked out with no notice. He was restless. He wandered the city for three more days, toting along his brown suitcase. He sat in cafes, puffed on his cigarettes as he walked. Reg soon found himself in East Ham, in Newham, miles away from Roughton House. He was almost out of money. He asked directions back to Kensington. As he changed routes, he stopped. I stood at a crossroad, and all of a sudden I realized a policeman had held the traffic up and had beckoned me to go across, he remembered. I did not want to go across, but I went across and thanked him as I passed. He slept on the streets like a filthy vagrant, yet he still approached women, hoping to rendezvous with one. No luck. He just couldn't help himself, like a drug addict searching for another high. Reg was desperate now and incredibly fretful. Whenever he went to a cafe to eat, the diners were talking about him. He heard Christie, followed by discussions about the murders. It somehow didn't panic him. He would take off his hat and listen. Even though every policeman in the city was searching for him, no one seemed to notice that he was right there, sitting nearby. Reg was invisible. 
as he had been for much of his life. I just finished in the ordinary way and had a smoke and finished tea, Reg said, and I just got up in the ordinary manner and went out. He walked by a newspaper stand. Will the killer strike again was the headline in large print. Reg glanced down and continued on. It was nine o'clock, Tuesday morning, March 31st, one week after Beresford Brown had discovered his secrets in the kitchen. Reg walked along the lower Richmond Road facing the Thames near Putney Bridge. He stopped and leaned against the embankment wall. His arms braced against the concrete as he stared down at the bargemen while they loaded a vehicle. They looked up at him. He stayed silent and sullen. He looked tired and sallow and appeared as if he had not washed for some time, said one of the workers. His face was grimy and he looked as though he had been sleeping out of doors. Reg could imagine the scene at his home, detectives with shovels and crowbars disassembling Ten Rillington Place looking for more victims. He knew he was being closely watched, not by the bargemen, but by a tall, thin police constable staring at him from a few yards away. It wouldn't be difficult to recognize him, given the incredibly detailed descriptions in the press. Every newspaper printed his picture. The constable walked over to him. Reg stayed still. He was too weary to run. And why should he? What are you doing? Looking for work? asked P.C. Thomas Ledger. Yes, but my unemployment cards haven't come through, Reg replied. Where do you come from? asked Ledger. Paddington. What is your name? asked P.C. Ledger. John Waddington. Waddington was the last name of Ethel's brother, Henry. What is your address? 35 Westbourne Grove, he replied. Have you anything on you to prove your identity? Nothing at all, said Reg. P.C. Ledger looked him over. Take off your hat. By this time several more constables had joined Ledger. They looked at every detail of his face. I asked the man if he would accompany me to Putney Police Station, as I believed him to be John Christie, who could help with certain inquiries, said P.C. Ledger. Reg climbed inside the police van, then tossed his wallet at the constable with his identity card inside. And just like that, it was over. Later, when police searched Reg's pockets, they discovered a curious News of the World clipping from the winter of 1950. It had the headline, Second Murder Charge Against Young Husband, detailing Reg's testimony against Timothy Evans. The Welshman had been nothing more than a rotten corpse in a prison graveyard for two years, a degenerate killer who had slaughtered his wife and daughter, at least as far as the public was concerned. But soon... Tim Evans and his case would be roused.